Hey, everybody. Welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kirby. Of course, this show is all about small nonprofits doing great big things. And I cannot think of a more important topic to talk about for small and medium-sized nonprofits than communication and presentation in a virtual world is much different than it was in person. So I brought the only human being that I trust when it comes to presenting on stage or in virtual world. He is a, an author. He is a speaker. He's an entertainer. He is a coach. He is a general do-gooder. He is uh, my good friend, Mark J. Lindquist. Mark, welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here. Yes. I'm very excited for you to be on the show. I, 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 this, is, this is one of the um, great mysteries, I think, that the nonprofit world are trying to figure out is how to present and how to give, um, how to storytell, how to interact with people virtually. And so your experience on stage and in film and in everything else is going to give them a wide variety of information to take. So if somebody's flipping through and they're like, Mark J. Lindquist, I think I've seen this guy or heard this guy at numerous football games or NCAA games or blah, 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 everything. You've done everything. For those of you who don't know, Mark, give us a kind of 5,000 foot view on who you are and how the heck you got to where you are now. How about a 5,280 foot view? How about that? Yes, I accept. But yeah, let's go mile high. Here we go. Um, I'm, I'm a local guy. If, if you know Patrick Kirby and his, uh, his home, uh, home turf, stomping grounds, Fargo, North Dakota, Red River Valley. Um, I spent half of my adult life uh, there. I grew up in Ortonville, Minnesota, and I learned to sing the national anthem at the Friday night football games at the Ortonville Trojan uh, football contest that we didn't win many of. But for me, the highlight was singing the national anthem, and now I get to do that for the NFL these days. Uh, and so I'm an entertainer. I'm, I'm, I'm a communicator. Um, and they have been fortunate fortunate to figure out a way to make a living uh, holding one of these, you know? And um, it certainly is like the snow globe got sh shaken up, right, Patrick? Yep. In the last couple months. And so, you know, virtual communication certainly is a topic, I think, that, that uh, um, I, don't, I don't know if people really paid a lot of attention to prior to two months ago. So I think it's going to be a good topic today. I think so. And I, I, you, you had to pay attention to it if it was a snow day here in flyover country where you couldn't make it into the office and like, okay, be on a Zoom call and you'd be sitting in the background doing 10 different other things than paying attention to your boss, you know, talking about budget numbers or something else. This is now a, you have to interact, you have to fundraise, you have to market, you have to communicate a message during a pandemic and your small organization yeah. is fighting against a battle between very large organizations, very big names, and a lot of marketing power. And this, I think, comes down to, can you tell a better story and how do you present in a virtual fashion better than anybody else? So that's I, what I'd love to, to start with that, is being on stage. And you, how many stages did you speak on last year in 2019? No, I do 80, 90, 100 a year, depending on the year. Okay. Yeah. And traveling 300 days a year, getting to these hundred and some gigs. Yeah. Um, I love you it. Know, on the road. You, you know that when you're on stage and you're giving a, a presentation, you can feed off of an audience. Yes. How on earth do you make the switch to have a joke or a line or some sort of insightful piece of information that you'll have a gasp or an audible or a visual response from somebody else? And how do you how do you translate that to a Zoom call, for example? How do you how do you work on that? What's a starting point? Well, first of all, uh, I have been working through these these questions myself, right? So I'm not I'm not the expert here on Patrick's podcast who who's going to tell you how to do this because I know because I don't know either. All right, um, have some experience with the spoken word and communicating and yeah. and uh, getting nod their head, getting people to agree, you know, buy in, all this stuff, winning people over. This is something that we do um, in in a face-to-face in -face world. And so <clears throat> I think the first and most important uh, thing to talk about with, with communicating via a Zoom medium right now or in an online presentation is you got to give yourself a break, right? Yes. Because uh, you have to remember, and this is not to discourage you, but you just have to remember what we're now dealing with, which is in a virtual world where now 
you are literally sitting in front of a screen right now. At that very moment, you're sitting in front of a screen. And you have to remember that you can't just give the same presentation you were going to give if it were to be live. Because right now, the audience member, which is you, looking at a screen, now your brain is trained in a different way. If I'm looking at a screen, now my competition or the thing my brain is going to uh, 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 compare what I'm seeing, it's going to compare the latest viral video on YouTube that's got 18 million hits, right? Mm -hmm. it's going to it's going to be the, 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 uh, the, the Snapchat story or the Instagram story or Tom Hanks and Tom Cruise, who has spent an entire career learning how to spread emotion, how to emote through a camera, right? And so now it's an entirely different discipline. And so now, more than my live performance uh, <clears throat> tips and tricks and all the things that have gotten me, you know, on stages all over the world, it's almost like... Yes, it's the same game, American football and soccer, because it's on a field and they play with a ball. Mm -hmm. there's, only, there's only like this much overlap, right, between the two games. And so we have to understand that now the skills that you would use as an actor, as I was on ABC's Lost, you know, and CBS's Hawaii Five-0 and the Universal Studios movie Battleship, now you just have to flip the switch and say, okay, what worked live may not work anymore because remember, Patrick, we, we've talked many times. My speech starts long before the first word of my speech. Mm -hmm. Speech and my presentation starts the moment they walk in the room. Mm -hmm. What music is playing in the background as they walk from the lobby to the conference room, right? Um, um, I've done a sound check at, at that... Uh, at that venue before. So, so uh, uh, now I'm asking myself in a Zoom situation, do I know how to run the mute button? Do I know how to run the video button? Because, because now in a Zoom setting, for me to be fumbling around with all that technology, even for a moment, well, you've already lost half the audience, right? Mm -hmm. I'd be the equivalent of a live speaker coming up on stage and saying, um, you know, after they say, ladies and gentlemen, fantastic speaker, Mark J. Lindquist, and you walk on stage and go, um, does this thing work again? Is this thing on? You know, that's yep. like rookie mistake 101. So, you know, there are some things, like I said, there's some things that, 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 that will overlap, like the sound check with, with the mic and the technology. But there's a whole new, uh, uh, um, there's a whole new canvas in front of you when it comes to learning how to communicate via via this it, it it's so funny so, uh, let's start with what is so relatable and is is no different than doing an in-person interview or conversation with a donor or a, a a sponsor or your stakeholders or whatever you mentioned sound check equipment yes. equipment is just key Again, yeah. you don't need the best equipment. You don't need, but you need equipment that works and you need to know how to use it. So spending your time, um, instead of crafting your, um, uh, you know, what I'm going to say 20, 30, 50 minutes into whatever I'm going to present, work on the thing that people will notice the most, which is sound. Uh, look at from a background standpoint. Is your background interesting? Do you have your lighting well? Have you tested the camera? Do you like what you see? If you were looking at this, would you want to continue to watch for a significant amount of time? Those are the basics of the basics that everybody right now in a virtual world can work on and improve in a heartbeat, right? Yes. Well, it, it's even just an, a knowledge of, now, now, now think what you see on TV. Yep. When you're watching an evening news broadcast, when you're watching the CBS evening news or what, whatever you watch. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain way they, they, they frame themselves, right? There's, there's never an interview where the guy's back here like this, right? Yeah. Never. never. Cause think about the, look at the percentage of the screen that my face is taking up right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Do look at, look at your TV tonight. You'll see that everybody is about, is about this, but right, right about like that. Right. And so then yes. they, you know, yep. Yep. They'd cut off the screen right here. And then that would be my interview. And then here's, here's, here's a free tip. Pro tip. Oh, like Patrick says, pro tip. Pro tip. We're all attendees in these Zoom meetings, right? Now, think, go through in your head. 
if you're standing face to face with somebody who's speaking or you're an audience member in the audience, I, as a presenter, I'm always feeding off of what I'm seeing out there, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the speaker who, who looks at this person and, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get him. No, that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm in a presentation. Why would I put a negative thought in my brain while I'm live? It makes no sense at all to me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the person that's smiling and nodding, right? Because there's always one of them. You yeah. just got to find them because, because live presentation is so nerve-wracking to most people. What you need up there is positive reinforcement. And so the pro tip is if you are an interested and engaged learner and listener, then on Zoom calls, you better be looking right at that camera. You better be giving that person eye contact because you know who I will feel connected to on an hour long Zoom call when there's 78 different you know, heads looking at me. I'm not gonna remember the person that looked like this the whole time, right? I'm not gonna remember the person that was doing this the whole time. I'm going to remember the person who made eye contact with me mm -hmm. because even though we're virtual, human beings still need that. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. And, and that will actually, and, and, and again, when you're on stage and you're making eye contact with somebody, that gets you into hyperdrive, right? You know that you're, at least you've got an audience of one and yeah. that becomes your person that you're going to present to for the rest of the day you can go around the room and you can make eye contact with somebody else but you're always going to go back to the person who smiled who's nodding who's positively affirming so that's a really wonderful tip that if you are getting nervous in a virtual environment you don't know how things are going make eye contact with the one person who's even nodding smiling and paying attention the most that's your go-to that's your first line of uh line of thing and, and and you said something wonderful at the beginning of this which is give yourself a break and I think that in what is this reality we live in now is that you're going to get a lot of grace for a lot of hiccups yeah. that could happen. So understand that out of the gate and don't apologize for every small thing that goes wrong. You burn through and you're, you're going to learn to be professional and just kind of get through it the entire time. anyway, Right. Your perseverance is going to help you be a better presenter in a virtual realm, knowing that everybody else is going through the same technical hiccups as you are based on internet connection or some person who hasn't uh, muted themselves because they just don't know how to. And I've used this example a while back was when the Supreme Court were doing their court cases yes. live on Zoom, some guy who was not on mute went to the bathroom and flushed the toilet. And, and that is now documented in the halls of, of everything that's ever- That was on? Yes, live. <sighs> Dur during the Supreme Court case argument, the defense or the prosecutor, like, what, it, they're going through it and you hear the flush of a toilet and he just burns right through it. It's, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Yeah. And, and so if the Supreme Court can't get the mute button right, it's okay that you don't as well. And I think right. that's, what, that's such a wonderful tip to give is that understand that people are going to give you a break. But do the things that you mentioned, which is make sure that your sound is right, the background, how would you like to be uh, in front of a camera or how would you like to be presented mm -hmm. to as your first line of, of thought process? Because I think that self-awareness is such a wonderful hot tip that you have given everybody who's trying to figure this out as well. If, if, if I may jump on that one, one more thing, please. <laughs> um, I, I think that with the virtual presentation realm that we're in, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I mean, not even just the virtual presentation realm, like the whole global pandemic, right? Yeah. And because what, what we, we're recording this on uh, Friday, May 22nd, right? Correct. And so, uh, just you know, for historical context here, when you're when you're 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 looking back at this, is that right now uh, is a period of 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 great uncertainty in everybody's mind. Um, I mean, I, I just heard the CEO of Coca Cola do an interview, and you know, one one word that he used was uncertainty, right? And so, don't. This is my tip on knowing your audience and and knowing knowing the environment, knowing the time, right, that you're in because I think it's tone deaf to come on a call, any call these days, any interview you're doing, any presentation you're doing, and giving, giving off a feeling as though you know what to do in yeah. the midst of a global pandemic. Yes. Let me tell you, 
all of my colleagues in the first couple of weeks, or many of them, you know, I was seeing lots of, lots of um, webinars about, you know, here's how to thrive through a global pandemic. And I was like, how do you know? Yeah. What I'm finding, because I'm talking to a lot of people, you know, at a lot of different levels of society. And um, <clears throat> one thing that's almost universally turning people off is a know-it-all mm -hmm. pandemic, right? And so come to these presentations with some humility. See, because that's not something you might not have thought about when you're, when you're writing a speech. You, you need to think at the, you know, like you said, the 5,000 foot view and say, okay, what kind of tone do I need to strike for this, this presentation today? It may be completely different from the kind of peacock, puff out your chest, you know, you know, do one of these before you come from backstage and pump yourself up. It may not be that your people need or want that right now. And I've even had to learn that lesson. Me, a professional motivational speaker who's been on stage, you know, in front of millions. When this first thing kicked, you know, when we started doing Zoom more and more, I think I did. I probably, I probably crossed the line as far as energy and enthusiasm and jazz hands and ah! Because it doesn't translate in the same way as if I were live. You see what I'm yep. saying? Yep. Talk to me about this because this is fascinating because I think a lot of nonprofits, especially the small and medium-sized ones, who are already super nervous or overly humble about asking for donations. Sure. Walk to me about how, how would you be humble and yet confident in knowing that your organization is doing great things, but needs your help. Cause I don't think that organizations can both be humble and then refrain from asking because I think they're going to get shut out for money because people aren't going to take, they're like, oh, well, that's adorable. I'm glad they're humble. How do you take your humility and yet exercise your communication by saying, we're very, you know, hey, we're, we understand that this is troubling times, but, but by the way, we're doing amazing things and you got to help us too. How do you, how do you balance the humility with confidence that you need as a, as a fundraiser asking people for money? I guess um, <clears throat> in professional communication, right? We we say that there are a few there are a few like check marks you have to hit for every presentation. Yep. Bring some energy, right? Nobody wants to hear from you know womp 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 for too long. Mm -hmm. You know we can get into later about how one creates dialogue on these Zoom calls and facilitation is twice as easy as presentation virtually, right? Yep. And so, um, um, uh, wait, wait, what was the question? My brain just, <laughs> it just went blank. It just went totally blank. <laughs> That's okay. We, we all have, uh, we all have COVID brain too. Oh yeah. Humility, right. How do you balance humility with the confidence that you need to project? As right. a, because, yes, because, yes. I, because I think what you hit on is right. And we're going to come back to that right away, which is this, with this, this dialogue and storytelling, because I think that has a lot to do with this. But as you're, as you're mentally trying to jump hurdles, because I totally get what you're saying, is that you can't come over here and just be, again, I'm, the most, I'm one of the most positive human beings that I know. I'm a glass yeah. overflowing, uh, but yes. I know reality, right? So yeah. there has yeah. to be a balance. I'm a, I will be enthusiastic till the day I die. It's going to be great. That's my, yes. that's my MO. However, I understand that there are troubled times and there are things that we need to work on and we can't be all like, this is, doesn't matter. Let's go on as business as usual. It doesn't work. Balancing humility with the confidence that asking people for a lot of money or asking in general, how do we do this? For the details on how to ask and, and what to say for asking them for the money, I, I, I direct you back to Patrick Kirby, but I'll give you the four things that good presentations have Yes, make, that make your audience receptive to whatever ask you have at the end. I like whether it. I'm selling, you know, whether, you know, what, whatever I'm selling. Um, be it a speech, be it a performance, be it a you know, public appearance, you know, you know I, I, I was uh, in the financial services game for a while, whatever that is, here's the four things that you want to make sure you have. Like I said, energy, right? Yes. You want to make them laugh if you can. And, and, and I know it's harder to make people laugh on you know, maybe a virtual uh, 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 setting, so here's my substitute. Laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. Let them hear it, right? Because more than anything today, we need a little smile. We need a little laugh. We need a little levity, right? And, and even if it's not gut-busting belly, you know, you know, slapping laughter, here's, here's what just happened when it, when it went from live stage to virtual, which is if audible laugh was my bar live, 
Now smile and look up at the screen is now my new bar, right? If I can make that happen. So once again, energy, make them laugh or just smile, right? Mm -hmm. Let them hear you laugh and that'll, that'll just make you more, people want, to, people want to see you having a good time. Yeah, you're endearing. And how funny he is when, when, when uh, he's the one laughing at his own jokes during the skit, right? Mm -hmm. Number three, say something they haven't heard before. Mm. Now, that's pretty hard. In today's world of, of uh, you know, people shoving content down your throat at every which way on LinkedIn and, 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 and you know, emails and Snapchats and, and just newsletters, it's, it's content overload. So to say something they've never heard before, oh, that's a presenter's dream. Finally, make them think like they've never thought before, right? So you got to bring some energy. You got to make them laugh. You got to say something they've never heard before. You got to make them think like they've never thought before. If you're putting together a presentation about what your nonprofit is doing and the initiatives that you're a part of, because right now during the, 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 the pandemic, I would, this is just me, business consultant, you know, uh, going rogue on Patrick's podcast here. My advice is you got to have something new, right? You got to have some new initiative, got to have some new program that you're doing to, to, uh, you know, to, to respond to the increase in demand. It's got to be new and fresh. So you got to be excited with that energy, you know, and with a smile, just like on the tip of your tongue. And you got to be talking about these things that they've never heard about before, because think about how short your attention span is. As soon as you hear something that you like, like, like if, if your husband or wife or your, or your uncle or your grandma, started to tell a story that you know you've heard 10,000 times. What does our brain immediately do? Oh, I've heard this. Mm -hmm. oh, right? So you can't be seeing stuff that everybody's heard before. You can't be just regurgitating and repeating what you heard on, on the latest TED Talk. You gotta come up with your own thoughts and then make them think like they haven't thought before. And I think this is where Patrick comes in. You, 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 I'm gonna pass, pass the baton to you, right? Because what do we want them to be thinking of, right? We want them to be thinking of, of, of how they're, they, if, if the person you're asking, can, are you allowing them to be the hero? Am I hitting anything good there, Patrick, right? No, you are. This, I mean, this is Hero's Journey 101, if you're yes. talking about storytelling, because I think we're going to dive right back in there. And I, to, to, to circle back and come, your humility is acknowledging that this is not normal, but it is now reality, right? Uh, I use the, uh, we, I mean, I think I've used this a little bit on the podcast too. After 9-11, it was really weird that we had to take off our shoes and belts when we got on an airplane. Yeah. Now that is the reality of things. It's not weird anymore. It's just what we right. do. Right. This too shall pass in that sense of mourning that go back and go, okay, well, we just can't get together in big groups across the country and large 50,000 uh, first and venues for a while. And that's just the reality of it, right? Yeah. Um, I think the confidence comes in knowing that you are doing right by those you serve. And again, like you said, you just tell them something different that say, hey, in this new environment that we're in, we're doing now this. Same mission, same goal, same mm -hmm. true north, but we're doing the things that we have always done in a way that is different. And that sort of is that say different sort of mentality. And the think of make them think about something they've never thought before is how do they give the same amount of money making a radically different impact because the need is so much greater. Yeah. All of a sudden my $40 gift to your organization is now exponentially more important or my thousand dollar gift is way more important than it was a year ago because yes. it's now feast or famine. And so now my brain, because you know, you've gotten me into this, this four pieces, my brain now tells me, let them think about how different their $1,000 means now than it did a year ago or six months ago. It's right. radically different. Now you're thinking about something different, but you're not changing mission. You're not changing your, 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 uh, your, your gut instinct on what you need to say, but you're positioning yourself as the humble warrior that is confident in what you're doing because you're using uh, you know, humor and you're using yeah. a, a smile when we need it most, but you're also using, uh, you're saying something in a different way that then triggers your brain to pay attention. And now you're thinking differently about where your gift is gonna go. I think it's brilliant. I think that's, that's exactly where I think we wanted to go. And I love hearing that from you because that gives us now a framework on how to tell your story.
Yes. So that's a wonderful transition into let's talk about dialogue and let's talk about storytelling in the time of a lot of noise because yeah. everybody is online right now. Everybody. Yes. Yes. How do you rise above the fray? And I think, and you're going to tell me if I'm really off on this, I think the better storytellers will win the day. Absolutely. Um, because right now the bar is pretty low. Wouldn't you say? I mean, people don't come to a Zoom meeting expecting to be wowed, right? So if you can, if you can find yourself in a place where, where um, you feel like you have a command of your material, where you feel like, you, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe this is a time because, hey, this is a discipline that we're not well versed in. Maybe this is a time you have to rehearse a little bit. You know, you have to do the things like I've done as a musician and an entertainer. You got you to gotta work that out because I, I think... As, as much as, you know, I know we opened with the give yourself some grace and, and, and yourself a break and, and all that. Uh, but at the same time, Patrick, would you agree, business, is still ha business still has to get done in the world, right? And so it's almost like I see it as a yin and a yang and a seesaw and a back and a forth. It's like, uh, I, I, think, I think, you know, the humility is, is more when, when you are the guest expert, right? Um, you know, you're representing a nonprofit and you're going to be asking for an investment. On, on behalf of, of, uh, uh, of the needs that you represent. And, and there you can definitely be full of confidence because that's your expertise, right? Um, uh, and I think that if you put a little bit of work into what we're talking about in the presentation and, and, and mindful of, of just simple, simple way to, 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 to best present, like I think that you're, you're immediately gonna have a little head start on everybody else who didn't even take the time to think about this they're yeah. just presenting in the same way all the time right um so i think i, th I think you're 100 percent right on the bar being very low because i think nobody has expectations and so anything different and anything new and anything that looks polished not pristine but just yeah. worked on in a, in a Zoom or in a virtual environment is going to look exponentially better than the other people who are just getting there to get by or do yeah. something. It is the new equivalent, as, as I'm finding, is recording yourself in an interaction like this and replaying it the way that you would see yourself in a mirror sure. before you go on stage. I, I think I think recording yourself giving a portion of the presentation or being able to see yourself on and the way it looks in a virtual world. My hot tip to most people would be, what does it look like to someone else watching you give a presentation? And are you using hand gestures? And you don't have to be like you and I who just constantly move our hands in a motion that right. is, disturbs people who are, you know, to, to, the, to the common human being, but being lively in, a, in an environment that is naturally boring and boxy and Brady Bunch yes. is going to draw people to watching you. The same yes. way that you are, Mark, the stage is only this big now, but it's a stage, mm. isn't it? Right. That, that's controlled space. The way right. that you're, the way that you're moving, and the and the props in which you use, and the and the things that you have. Yeah, it's the jazz hands on the thing. It's unexpected because everyone right. is used to somebody sitting there going, "Okay, my face is too close to the thing, and I'm going to talk very monotone, and I'm not going to use any uh, voice things." Yeah, yeah. Can I jump in here, please? I, th I think I, you're nailing it right now because the, absolutely. Like when I walked off, you know, stage left over here. I mean, if you do that, like you, you, you're, you've lost, you lost, lost, uh, uh, well, you can use it strategically. Like a lot of times I'll run into my closet and I'll go do a wardrobe change, you know, and I'll come back. Right. It's just, it's just, if you look at, at the way, watch your favorite YouTube video, highly produced, you know, maybe it's a Ted talk or something. They switch the screen about every eight to 12 seconds, right? Because your brain just needs a, needs a different thing. Watching a newscast, you know, camera one, camera two, camera three, right? And, and, and you know, I as a presenter, you know, I usually have an image up here because what, do you, what are you used to when you're watching the news? Newscaster, image, newscaster, image. And so, so to use those, that variety as often as you can because you got to realize static doesn't work. Mm -hmm. static, 
will, will, will lose attention like that. And let me give you a pro tip. The old death by PowerPoint, you know, where you would put a PowerPoint slide up there and you'd have four bullets and you'd, then you just read them to the audience. Well, that was bad in live presentation. It's worse on Zoom. Yes. Please don't, please don't do that. You might need your, your slide, you know, uh, 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 for mental reference, but don't show it to the audience, right? Give them something, you know, do something better like this. You know, we're going to give them this visual aid, you know, and people make people look at the screen. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get more creative than what you used to get by doing, right? You might, you might have to, to, uh, you know, use the chat strategically. The few first few moments of, of your meeting, if you're running the meeting, you know, I'd set up some norms, you know, everybody else is going to be muted. So we're going to set up meeting norms and we're going to, we're going to give them, okay, thumbs up, thumbs down, some, some sideways. That's how you communicate. You got to come up with some sign language with your group to know like I was just on a National Speakers Association call the other day, 33 speakers from, from Columbus, Ohio. They were all muted, but they were trained. Because when someone was introduced, what do they do? Yeah. Visually, you have to give it to them visually because that's half of the communication now, right? I, I think this gives you a free pass to be creative in your visual storytelling more than you've ever gotten in your entire life. If you're sitting in a board meeting, you're talking with your board of directors, there is decorum that you are expected to, to go through. Now, your board members are going to be looking at the meeting notes from last meeting that they have not looked at since the last meeting because that's what board members do, is that they don't look at the things until the meeting days. So you have to get something from them by being interactive or presenting in a way that is gonna have them pay attention. And so to be creative to get them to all eyes on you. Yeah, fair game. Exactly. To lots of questions, that, lots of, you know, put it in the chat. Right. You know, what do you think about this scale of one to 10? What does everybody think? You'll get all kinds of engagement, right? It's the same techniques. It's just done in the virtual platform. And, and, and you and I know this as well, doing this for quite some time, the last number of months, is that the engagement you can get in a virtual setting is probably more than you could in a face-to-face -face audience because there is not the pressure of I'm going to interrupt somebody. I'm not going to interrupt and say, amen, or preach on. You can right. say that in chat now. You can interact a lot better. And now the, the fear of if I participate in the live audience, the speaker will pick me out and bring me on stage. That's gone. It's done. So you can get more engagement because Absolutely. of Absolutely. No, I love it. So you've got the visual things. Storytelling wise, in a virtual world, how do we, how do we tell our story, like audibly tell our story? Are we starting with the same techniques as we did on stage or in front of people? Are we starting with, let me, let me uh, paint a picture for you? Or are we coming out of the gate hot? What are, what are our different options that we have to present in a virtual world that are not because I don't think the gimmicks that we could use on stage work anymore as well as they do on stage, right? All right, everybody, how's it feeling? And give me a high five. And I, I don't think you can yeah. do that. So yeah. what are some yeah. of the techniques that we can do to translate that first part of the story? Our thank first thank goodness this global pandemic is going to rid people of the horrible habit of walking on stage and saying, how's everybody doing today? Or even worse, and I and again, I'm going to call myself out on this because I've done it before. It's the how's, there, how's everyone how's everyone doing today? Oh, you could do better than that. How's everyone doing today? I know. Gonna, I know. How do I mute you? How do I mute you? How do I take off your own podcast? I have 100 you, percent power on mute. What are you a rookie? What are you new? Yes, I know. Steve Martin. Steve Martin. If if you're really interested in this stuff, go on Masterclass. It's very affordable, and watch Steve Martin's Masterclass on him in performance. And he always says, I mean, this is something that, that, that I totally agree with him. Why would you waste your first impression saying something like, well, saying something that everybody else says that doesn't get you any further or make you any more impressive than anybody else they've seen, right? We're creative, like, come on, you got to be able to capture their attention in a, in, in, in a different way. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily higher energy is what you want. No. We're gonna, you gotta be willing to be new right now. Yeah. You gotta be willing to try something out and, and, and then trust your gut and know if that was, if it worked or not, right? One of, one of the things that we have used as a cornerstone at Do Good Better is 
the way we've always done it is the most dangerous phrase in the English language. And now more than ever, that is so evident. So you are 100% right, Mark, because you yes. have to do something different because what worked then does not work now. It absolutely doesn't work. Like I couldn't wear these on stage before. You could, I could not. A hoodie and a beanie. But right now, it, it, you have to be willing. You, we are all baby giraffes right now. We can't even walk. We don't know what this is. I don't even, I'm trying to sit here and wonder, I'm asking myself, what percentage of the rules that I knew in the world that existed pre-pandemic, what yeah. percentage of those old rules apply? Because, for example, I don't even know if I can shake a person's hand, right, mm -hmm. in this new America 2.0 we're building, right? And so, so I believe, once again, put my business consultant hat on, I believe the person who, who swings the bat. Yep. Yep. Swing the bat, takes a chance, and figures out what their pitch is fastest, that's the person that's going to win. Yep. I, I, I think that's uh, great. That's your lead. So lead in with something brand new and don't follow the rules. It, it, again, it's going to be so much more glaring now than it is has ever been because you're on film and there's no escape. No amount of arm movement or things are going to save you from the same boring introduction. So that's number one. How quickly do you get into meat and potatoes as far as virtual events? Because I've got two theories on this, and I'd love to hear yours. Sure. One, I think gone are the 75-minute keynote uh, presentation things in the virtual world. I don't think people have the attention span, you talked about this, uh, to do that. But there has to be some sort of relatability in presentations with your donors and supporters and stakeholders and, and, and individuals you're trying to woo uh, over to your side. How, what's the balance between not fluff, but just sort of the, the story build, the here's our background, here's what we do, here's our impact, to knocking it out of the park right away. This is, I'm not going to save you, I'm going to save you a lot of time by doing this. You have to build rapport. What does it look like now? How do, how do we balance that? Well, let me ask you, what setting is this? Like, is, are these a lot of uh, cold call situations? Are they long-term donors? What, why are they on a Zoom call in the first place? I would say, let's just, let's just start with um, somebody that you're trying to solicit and you may, may know something about you, but not everything. Let's go with that as a scenario. You're a business owner, Mark. I'm a, oh no, I'm a business owner. You're a nonprofit leader. You're trying to get me to sponsor a, a virtual event coming up, and that's kind of how we're going to roll it. I know of you, but I don't really know you uh, personally. Um, I'm, I'm, this is the 15th virtual phone of, you know, call I've made in the last three days. Sure. Now what? Well, um, I'd ask some questions first. I'd ask the question, is a Zoom call the best way to advance this relationship? Brilliant. Right? Maybe you should be doing a phone call, right? Um, I think it's funny how what was what was the stats, Patrick? I think it was it was uh, uh, ten million users of Zoom in December of two thousand and nineteen. Uh, and forgive me if I'm off a little bit here, but it was exponentially large. It was two hundred million yep. that were users in March, right? And so I feel like we we all we all went like whoa, way over here. Zoom, 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 zoom. And I mean. What's the sentiment you're hearing these days? I mean, people have zoomed out, right? Absolutely. Uh, how, so, many, how many times can they just sit on the same? And again, because it's the same. And we have these supercomputers in our pockets, Mark. That's, you're exactly right. I think that is where I think people are in a virtual world. You can still go back to the super familiar, which is picking up the phone and having a conversation, isn't it? I'm... I'm I'm not doing very many Zoom meetings these days anymore. <laughs> these days, like we've been doing this, you know, for forever. Doesn't it feel like that though? Isn't that the fun? That's the funny part about this. We've already it's, gotten fatigue in this whole, like, it's crazy. It's, it's, and, and, and there's something to do with the lack of real human connection, you know, and all that. But, but um, I would just ask, I mean, I'm getting a lot of business done just on the phone, no video, right? Because it, it, to me, um, well, now I'm going to get into my live performance brain. You know, whenever I'm up there and, and I'm, I'm responsible for the content and the performance, I'm going to remove all of the variables or as many as I can and make them, you know, put a fail safe in, you know, like I'm going to have a backup microphone, right? I'm going to have a, a, a backup laptop at the AV table in case, you know, get, you get the blue screen of death, right? 
And so I'm going to build in these fail safes. And so I'm going to always put myself in a situation where I'm putting my best foot forward, right? And so think about that. Maybe Zoom is it the way you're putting your best foot forward. You don't need to do a Zoom call. If you know that your donor is 84 years old and had to ask his nephew to put him on the, call the guy, right? Why make, why make them feel awkward? That's not, that doesn't, if they feel awkward and weird in front of you, that doesn't lead them to open up their checkbook, right? Mm -mm. Them at ease too. So, so that's my first question is, should you even be doing it? Yeah. It's, right? And it's a wonderful self-awareness exercise out of the gate is you better know your donors and you better know those who are believers in your organization. And is this the best route to it? That's a wonderful tip uh, right out of the gate. I, I think it's just, I think it's so good. That's so, um, we're coming up to the end of our time on the podcast. Yeah. You know, we could talk about this for five hours. I'm going to have you back because there's just too much to talk about for sure. Um, but as somebody who is a motivational speaker by trade, who is renowned all over the United States, internationally now, my <laughs> friend, internationally. Um, this is a trying time for nonprofits everywhere, and I think we need a little bit of motivation. And at some point, we're going to look back, or we're going to listen to this podcast again to get a little couple of tips and tricks, and hey, did I use some of these things? But the clip that I'll probably pull out is the next couple minutes, which is give me the Mark Lindquist rah-rah speech um, or, or really, cause I think we need some of that every once in a while. And especially in the nonprofit world, we give exponentially more than we want to take in from, uh, praise and adoration because we're just do gooders. And that doesn't require us to, to, to seek out praise. I'm going to, I think one of the things that I am always trying to tell the nonprofit world is that you are awesome and you are great. And it, I, I need exponentially somebody to come on and let them know that as well. So Mark, as we wrap up yeah. our interview here on the official Do Good Better podcast, I leave the stage to you, the virtual stage, my friend. I'm going to give you the virtual stage. I would love you to give sort of an, uh, a state of the inspiration for our friends uh, in the nonprofit world from someone who is a born individual who was born to be a motivational speaker, I give the floor to you. This is from my father. Mm. The biggest mistake. Go ahead. The biggest mistake you could ever make is being afraid to make one. Mm. I think that, you know, uh, would you agree with that? That that's, that's, that's my mantra these days is I'm going to, fall flat on my face as quick as I can and figure out what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be better for it because I was willing to swing the bat and take a chance, right? I'm 38 years old, you know, a successful business person, but, but I'm willing to humble myself right now and learn about the world around me that is completely different or maybe is completely different than the one before. And so I would just, I would just say to yourself, um, let Let's be real for a second. Let's take a look at the oil patch out in Western North Dakota and what happened there. Big boom. You know, you couldn't take a left turn in Williston for years, right? People were making $100,000 driving water trucks. You know, I heard a story about a, a guy who rented an ice house and four people slept in there for 400 bucks a month. It was nuts. But then things settled down a little bit, right? And the thing that I heard about the oil patch after the boom had kind of settled down to a, a more manageable level was that it was actually good for the organizations out there because they, they you know, all the riffraff was out of town. If you want you know, if I'm able to say that, right. What ended up happening from the CEOs that I was speaking to out there in the oil patch is that now what you were left with was the ones that were really producing and really there to to help you advance the mission of you know be it Halliburton or Hess or whoever was out there right and so it was actually if you talk to the people you know after the 2012 craziness and now you're talking to them again in 2016 and 17 it was almost a sigh of relief yeah maybe the numbers and the profits weren't as high but it was more efficient and as I read Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena the other day you know that you know that line right it's not the critic who counts 
not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. You're the ones that are out there in the arena. The nonprofit sector, I mean, I would say follow Teddy, because what Teddy said in the extended version, if you, if you read the, the, the speech man in the arena, that he first uh, uh, debuted over in Paris in, two, in uh, 1910, he talks about the efficiency of a person. And I think that's what we nonprofit executives, maybe, maybe that's our, 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 our thing we're gonna, we're gonna hold on to through this whole thing. Yes, are you gonna see some contraction? Yes. Are you gonna see some people holding things tighter? And, and, and maybe it's not, maybe you're not getting, maybe your, your ratio was 20% close ratio and now it's 10, I don't know. But there is going to be some sort of contraction. I'll look at it as uh, uh, an exercise in efficiency. And so as we look out at 2021 and 22, I believe we can make plans to really, really run. For now, we pare down the, the, the you know, we're like pairing, we're pairing a, a, a bush, right? And it'll come back bigger and brighter in the future. For now, we're just gonna see some efficiency happen. Does that make sense? Makes total sense, man. That's the best, and I, again, I love it. Those that throw up their arms and walk away and give up the fight um, will not be remembered as well as those who dug their heels in and said, regardless of this pandemic, we're going to fight and we're going to kick ass and it's going to be awesome. And that's every nonprofit person I know. The, the real true hard, yes. die hard do gooders are the ones that are just stubbornly positive that they're going to do great work regardless of whatever environment that they're given. And I think that's great. And I think it's absolutely a perfect way to end this episode of the official Do Good Better podcast. Mark, you are a uh, wonderful human being. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yes, sir. How can people get a hold of you? They want to have you speak virtually. They want to connect with you. How can people get a hold of you? How can they uh, hire you? How can they just get more Mark J. Linquist in their life? Smoke signals, carrier pigeons, you know, Pony Express or markjlindquist.com. I said markjlindquist.com today. I love it. All that will be in the show notes as well as a bunch of other ways you can get a hold of Mark and follow Mark and watch him do amazing performances ever. My friend, thank you so much. You are the best. We'll see you next time on the official Do Good Better podcast.